Hey guys, Mr. Hyatt here. This is the AP Environmental Science Chapter 1 lecture. Uh, I'm just going to go through this really quickly because it, it's kind of just a, uh, an intro into environmental science and, and I, I think you'll get what you need just by uh, reading the chapter. So uh, we start with our three pr principles of sustainability. That's what this book is built upon. Uh, now we're going to use the updated version of this book uh, for the rest of the year, but uh, it's really similar. I have I have one copy. Uh, we don't have the student copies in just yet, but uh, still builds off of these three principles of, of sustainability. Um, it's gonna the book's gonna tie back to these three things uh, all year long. Uh, one is the reliance on solar energy, whether that's solar panels or uh, that's talking about how the sun fuels the food web and fuels uh, really everything here on Earth directly or indirectly. Uh, we're going to focus on biodiversity, which is the astounding variety and adapt adaptability of natural systems and species. We'll spend a lot of time on that. That'll be really clear by the uh, shoot by the next month or so. <laughs> That'll be clear. And then chemical cycling uh, could be nutrient cycling, could be food webs, all those types of things. So those are kind of the three themes of the book. Uh, a term that comes up repeatedly throughout the book is natural capital. And natural capital is essentially what nature does for itself plus what nature does for us. Um, so uh, we're going to talk about the natural capital of water and the atmosphere and, and all kinds of stuff. So uh, just bear in mind that when we say natural capital, this is what we mean. What does nature do for itself and what does nature do uh, for us humans? A couple of key terms that we need to, um, uh, we need to all be on the same page. We need to speak the same language. So a resource is going to be anything that we pull from the environment to help us. Uh, some of us are directly available for us to use. Some of them we have to process. So sunlight's going to be available right away. We don't have to do a lot to the rays of the sun. Uh, some like petroleum, we got to process. We got to purify it. We got to clear it. We got to uh, refine it, and then we can burn it. Perpetual resources are things that are always available, namely solar energy. Uh, a renewable resource is going to uh, take several days to a few hundred years to renew. Um, so you see some examples listed there. And then sustainable yield is the high, highest rate at which we can use a renewable resource without damaging the supply for the next generation. Again, that's just vocab, but it's, it's some, some key words that we're going to use throughout the whole year. Um, so uh, some more vocab. That, that's what a lot of this chapter is, just kind of getting us all on the same page. Um, we're going to look at how different societies and different specific countries uh, do in terms of their sustainability and in terms of uh, their policies towards the environment. Uh, so correlating with that or going right along with that is uh, several aspects of economics. So economic growth is going to be an increase in output of a nation's goods and services. GDP is, uh, you see, the market value of all goods and services. That's going to really relate to our resource consumption. And then per capita GDP is kind of our way of controlling um, per person. That's what per capita means. So uh, obviously different countries have different populations, so we need to find a way to eliminate that variable and look at what are what are each individual's resource consumptions. Uh, I worded that terribly, but I think you understand what I'm saying. Uh, continuing along those lines, uh, economic development is going to be using economic growth to raise the living standards. Uh, we're going to talk about more developed countries, less developed countries, developing countries, things along those lines. Uh, you might have called those third world countries at some point. Uh, so those are all uh, kind of some, some big economic types of uh, vocab words. In terms of pollution, uh, we're going to talk about point source and non-point source. Point source is where you can point at the source. That's kind of a uh, silly way to remember it. Comes from one specific spot. I gave you there a smokestack. Uh, Non-point source comes from a wide area. Could be like uh, the runoff from a farm field or a series of farm fields. Could be uh, the runoff from a neighborhood of uh, people treating their lawns. We don't know which person is treating their lawns, but it's coming from that neighborhood. Piggybacking off of that, biodegradable things are things that can be broken down over time, things like newspaper and and uh, wood, things like that. Non-degradable can't be broken down. That would be things like plastics. 
The tragedy of the commons is something that's really central to all environmental science, and it it's um, kind of the idea that where it comes from is uh, colonial America. Um, there were common spaces in the middle of towns, kind of like a town square, where everyone would just graze their animals. And as long as everyone grazed an appropriate amount, everyone shared the resource, then the resource stuck around for future generations. But you know as well as I do, there's always going to be somebody that's going to try to take more than their share. They're going to try to graze more than their share of livestock so that they can make more money. They can sell their, their uh, livestock and feed their family and all those types of things. So that's the tragedy of the commons, that we have all these th this common shared resource, but someone uh, through greed or other uh, nefarious motivations, uh, they're, they're going to take advantage of that. Uh, so there are three types of, of property or resource rights. We've got private property, common property, and open access. We'll talk a lot about those three uh, as we move through the year, um, but obviously here we're talking about common property. We certainly have increased our ecological footprints over the years. Um, 12,000 years ago, most of, of Earth's societies were hunter-gatherers. Uh, agricultural revolution, industrial medical revolution, and then basically the computer revolution uh, threw that out of whack. We, we got all kinds of increases in our ecological footprints. We're releasing lots of carbon dioxide. We're consuming lots and lots more uh, than we did when we were a hunt, hunting and gathering society. So. Um, Things have changed. There are four primary causes to environmental problems. We've got too many people, we waste, we're too poor, and then we don't pay for the harmful cost to the environment in the goods and services. Uh, the price that we pay for, uh, for uh, electricity doesn't reflect the amount of carbon dioxide and nitrates and sulfates that have to be pulled out of the atmosphere. So that's kind of a simplistic example of, of what's called an implicit cost. You'll hear me use that term a lot. It's built into uh, the cost. Uh, it's built into the product, but not necessarily built into the cost. I'm going to go quickly through this. Don't spend a ton of time on this uh, in your book because the, the next book doesn't spend a lot of time on it. So uh, let's skip quickly through that. Three big ideas. Rely more on renewable energy from the sun protect biodiversity, and last but not least, sustain chemical cycles by reducing waste and reducing consumption. That's chapter one.